Our optimal outcome, which we've been successful in doing uh, through the years, is to do either a refinancing or a leveraged recap where we sort of round trip our initial equity and we harvest profits for ourselves and our initial investors. And then we find a lower cost of capital, more medium to long term capital provider that's uh, willing to, you know, doesn't have to take the development risk or the ramp up risk. And now it's more of a maintenance risk. So a lower beta risk and a lower beta cost of capital. And then the, the perfect outcome, which we've also done knock on wood uh, several times, is the sale lease management back. Right where we acquire, develop, redevelop, and then ultimately do a sale lease management back, where we round trip the equity, and then we do a long term twenty five or thirty year lease and management contract and branding contract with uh, offshore investors. So, John, I thought a really cool place to start would just be like to go back to your first experience with real estate and how you got introduced to real estate and why you decided to pursue that as your life's work. The origin story, huh? Uh, The origin story. You know, look, I was pretty sure when I was in, you know, growing up, uh, people said I should be a lawyer and I thought about going to law school. um, And, and I, you know, ultimately if I had the patience, I would have done the JD and the MBA. I ended up doing the MBA, took real estate law, took business law. So added a little bit of law, but in the end, I, I decided I want to get into the business world, right? And so to me, um, I was sort of parallel tracking in college. I studied economics, but I did a minor in real estate, sort of real estate law, real estate finance, real estate fundamentals at the University of Michigan. And I, out of grad school when I was an undergrad, and so I figured I'd always be an investor in real estate at a minimum, right? I, would, I was going to invest in stocks and bonds and real estate, and that was sort of an asset class I wanted to be familiar with. Uh, but I was parallel tracking sort of the securities business and the real estate uh, business uh, coming out of college. Uh, and I think, you know, I would have uh, enjoyed both, but I, I was intrigued by the tangible nature of real estate, uh, the scale of it. I grew up in Chicago area and we've got sort of a great skyline and a lot of skyscrapers. And, you know, you have the Pacific Ocean in California, right? In, in Chicago, our Pacific Ocean is is Lake Michigan, but our skyline is really our calling card, right? And uh, so I grew up in and around tall buildings and loved them. And so at, at the end of the day, I parallel tracked job interviews and the best job offer I got coming out of college was with a global real estate firm called Finnam, which was a consortium of wealthy European families investing in real estate around the world. And they had bought uh, LaSalle and Madison in Chicago, which is sort of Maine and Maine. It certainly was at the time. And they were developing a high rise office building. So I shadowed the president. I became sort of the assistant to the president, learned finance and real estate construction, leasing and sort of the whole process of large scale urban development. And so it was really partly an opportunity to sort of be an assistant to the president and get a very bespoke sort of custom experience, apprenticing under a brilliant Ph.D. who really understood the global capital markets, as well as real estate investment generally and construction and leasing the whole picture. That offer was more unique than the offers I had to go to some, you know, uh, securities firms to be one of 20 or 30 analysts or whatever. So that's what I took. Um, and I learned a lot uh, over several years, uh, you know, developing uh, a big high rise uh, called 10 South LaSalle, which ultimately became Manufacturer Center for Plaza. Uh, and then I was part of a team that uh, ended up brokering a variety of large leases, both tenant rep brokerage and, and landlord and development and development management. So did that for about six or seven years. Um, uh, but then uh, in the, when the markets in the early 90s uh, crashed, uh, right, all the real estate related asset classes were overbuilt, right? Uh, hotels, office buildings, retail, apartments, everything was overbuilt. It was driven by tax laws. You were getting two to three to one write-offs by investing in real estate in the late 80s. So way too much capital was induced to come into the sector. And then sure enough, what happened was um, you know, the government changed the rules and a lot of stuff got overbuilt. And Sam Zell was saying, stay alive till 95 in the early 90s. And so um, I actually took a trip around the world um, and you know, went skydiving and scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef, skydiving in Australia, New Zealand and trekking all over the world. Uh, but came back, uh, applied to business school, uh, just two schools here in Chicago, Northwestern and University of Chicago. And I was lucky enough to get into both, and I decided uh, they're both great schools. I would have been happy either way, but um, I decided to go to UFC and study finance and economics. And 
And and then I worked for a Wall Street firm, actually, uh, when I was in business school, uh, Wasserstein Perella, the M&A shop, learning to structure leverage buyouts and M&A transactions. And then my vision was to sort of merge real estate investment with sort of corporate finance uh, and not knowing exactly how I was going to do that. I wanted to either buy a company or create a company. And then sure enough, while I was doing that, I began to study the distressed real estate markets. And uh, and then within real estate, hotels were always sort of a hybrid sector, half hotel, ha half operating business, half real estate, right? And so I began studying the sector. It was overbuilt, over leveraged. It was the canary in the coal mine. It got hurt first, but it was also likely to come out first. And so I went to school in the sector and, and started studying the sector and got pretty intrigued by uh, creating a business plan to sort of do a roll up in the distressed hotel sector. Again, leveraging my real estate investment and development and finance experience and my corporate finance understanding and global capital markets understanding. Uh, and so laid the groundwork to uh, create a company that would acquire and reposition the hotel real estate. And so that's sort of a long way of answering your question. But, you know, that was the genesis of why real estate and then why hotels within real estate. It was an opportunistic uh, strategy to take advantage of a distressed sector uh, and then to create a business around it. I want to go back to your experience working with the European real estate investor because you have European investors now and you run a global firm. How do Europeans think about real estate differently than Americans think about investing in real estate? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, number one, historically, as you likely know, they accept lower uh, investment returns because just historically, the cap rates in London and Paris and Munich and Frankfurt and various other sort of European capitals, uh, you know, they pay historically just low cap rates. Um, and depending on the foreign exchange rates at a given time uh, and what the FX situation is there, there's usually an arbitrage. So for them, I would say they are tend to be longer term holders and accept a lower rate of return. So but for them coming into the US, they found our unleveraged return on investment, our ROIs, our cap rates, if you will, to be attractively high compared to what they could get in many of their home markets. Uh, and so if they were sort of developing and or investing to get a 4% unleveraged return or sort of a 4% cap rate and you know, in London or Paris or, or even 3% at times, uh, if they could come into Chicago and get a, you know, 7% or a 7.5% or even an 8% unleveraged return on cost to develop a trophy office building at LaSalle and Madison, there was a lot of meat on the bone for them, right? And so that became quite compelling. And many of them began looking into the U.S. to diversify and, and chase yield, right? In the end, markets work. And uh, if there's more attractive yield elsewhere, capital will flow to where that yield is. Uh, and capital began flowing from Europe into the U.S. and into Canada uh, for that reason. So I think that's a big, that was a big part of the appeal. I think just diversifying for them away from their home markets, both to just have a diversified strategy and not have all their eggs in one basket was one driver. Secondly, there's only so big a market, you know, in any given country or area. And the U.S. and North America was a really big, robust market where they could deploy even more capital uh, and the arbitrage on the returns. Right. I think all of those were drivers uh, for European capital to deploy in the U.S. and in North America in general. Having that perspective, how do you then think about hold period in your current business. And I guess I would say that some of the deals I know that you've done, you've seemed to time the market beautifully. So maybe you can answer it in that context. Well, look, I mean, I think, you know, we've been, we've been, uh, knock on wood, uh, you know, I'd like to say we, we have a high cumulative investment GPA. Um, and we're blessed with that having been disciplined, uh, and, and, and also lucky, I'm sure. But it's not a 4.0. I mean, nobody's perfect, but uh, by any means, uh, no invest. Nobody who has been in the game long enough has an, an you know an absolutely perfect track record. But knock on wood, net net, our batting average is quite good. I think the, I think at the end of the day, uh, we've been sort of early aggressive buyers during you know contrarian buyers 
uh, during multiple uh, waves, you know, after multiple black swan events, right? I describe it as, you know, the black swan event of the early 90s was the RTC crisis. And we raised capital and began acquiring and repositioning and developing and redeveloping hotel real estate uh, throughout the U.S. And then we began harvesting really aggressively um, right in the late in the late 90s uh, because the arbitrage had shrunk. And uh, we thought that if we could sell assets for a given price, we'd rather sell them than hold them at that return. And so we round trip probably 90 percent of our value creation prior to the dot-com bubble burst and then 9-11 happening, which became sort of a new black swan event. And so, like everybody, we got defensive at the front end with our remaining portfolio, which was much smaller. We'd sold most of our assets, but we had a few. And uh, and then we went on offense uh, again, right, quite aggressively in 02, 03, 04, sort of Chicago, New York, and, and, and a variety of San Francisco and a variety of other places directly and through various affiliates at the time, um, and, and sort of went on offense. Um, and then began harvesting again, right? Began doing leverage recaps, sale leasebacks, uh, refinancings, and selectively sales to sort of harvest the value creation. And thankfully, we did that. Uh, and we'd gotten almost everything round tripped by 2007. I remember the summer of 27, uh, 2007, we had six, uh, three portfolios and three single assets or eight, uh, total, total of eight, I'm sorry, five single asset transactions and three portfolios that we had sort of tied up, if you will. And, and, and all of a sudden we began seeing some deterioration around operational performance. And I remember saying to my team in the conference room in the summer of 07, we cannot hold pricing here. You know, we, we, we tied these up based on what we felt were realistic assumptions going forward uh, that were disciplined, analytically sound, et cetera. But we just see some deterioration. We had no idea it was going to be to the degree it was. But we said we can't hold pricing. I said we're going to, in this case, have to make some sellers unhappy because we've got to be disciplined. And so we went around and said we can't hold this price and we're going to have to step back. And uh, and then we uh, of those eight transactions, we only did two. One of them we bought uh, part of the IBM building in Chicago, which we ultimately developed uh, into the Langham Hotel with the Langham team uh, in collaboration with them and uh, and ultimately sort of pre-sold the, the opportunity to them and then helped develop it. And then likewise, uh, one other apartment uh, building that we converted, but the rest of them we terminated and thank God we did, right? So um, we, we got defensive early and then when the, when the global financial crisis hit, we went into triage on the few deals that we had left, but we navigated those successfully and then we went on offense again and started buying distressed office buildings and converting them to hotels or mixed use projects, building apartments and, and, and did a lot of that and began doing sell leasebacks and so harvesting and then sure enough, uh, the, you know, the, the COVID hit. So we've had four major black swan events. And I think knock on wood, we've probably harvested 85 or 90 percent of the value creation pre major black swan event through discipline and, and serendipity and all the rest. Um, and then we went on offense with a, with a, with a, you know, with a vengeance each time uh, to get out ahead of, uh, of, of sort of the uh, the pack. Uh, to take advantage of it when everybody was running scared, you know, when it, when when there's a fire uh, in the theater, we run right into the theater, right? Um, and so we try to figure out, you know, how to do that in a disciplined way. So, um, look, I think, you know, I, I think we've been we we we've done a lot of harvesting, uh, refinancing, sale leasebacks, uh, leverage recaps, outright sales. Uh, and so, to answer your question in terms of what's our typical hold period, I think we typically underwrite. We're anywhere between a three and a seven year hold under our base case sort of scenario, because a lot of our deals are either portfolio acquisitions and turnarounds and repositionings or large scale single asset, you know, 200 to 300 million dollar, you know, uh, trophy buildings that we're converting to hotels or we're converting to a hotel and an apartment and we're building a high rise apartment next door or what have you. So they're pretty large scale single asset deals. And those are usually two or three year cycles to sort of get those launched and developed and entitled and financed and open. So, you know, sometimes it's six or seven years. Sometimes it's a shorter cycle, two, three, four years. But our optimal outcome, which we've been successful in doing uh, through the years, is, you know, to do either a refinancing or a leveraged recap where we sort of round trip our initial equity and we harvest profits for ourselves and our initial investors. And then we find a lower cost of capital, more medium to long term capital provider that's uh, willing to, you know, doesn't have to take the development risk or the ramp up risk. And now it's more of a maintenance risk. So a lower beta uh, risk and a lower beta cost of capital. 
And then the, the perfect outcome, which we've also done, knock on wood, uh, several times, is the sale lease management back, right? Where we acquire, develop, redevelop, and then ultimately do a sale lease management back where we round trip the equity and and then we do a long-term 25 or 30-year lease and management contract and branding contract with uh, offshore investors. Uh, and again, the, the development risk is out of the way. The operational ramp-up risk is out of the way. And really, it's more of a, a bond with a little bit of an equity kicker for them. Uh, and for us, it allows us to stay in an asset that we believe in and uh, are proud of and, and get a good solid return for our remnant capital and also earn management fees and and continue to grow our brand. So that's a real win-win. Whenever we can pull that off, we do. We're going to talk about a story where you did that. And I think you've done it a couple of times. Before we get there, going back to these Black Swan events, what are some of the patterns that seem to stay the same at each event? And then what kind of is always different? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's certainly a lot of commonalities, right? Which is sort of liquidity dries up, right? People run scared and, 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 and there is a great uncertainty. How long will this last? You know, is it going to get materially worse before it gets better? Are we at the bottom or near? And again, is the bottom going to be a, a, a six month bottom or is it going to be a three year bottom, right? Now, those are all questions that we ask each time. In my mind, there's never a, there, there's really a, not a doubt that things will come back and they'll come back with a vengeance. We're blessed that we live in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, don't bet against the U.S. economy, as Warren Buffett says, right? And so ultimately the engine that is the U.S., the dynamic U.S. economy grows itself out of its challenges in most cases, but it's choppy along the way and, and it's unpredictable. So I say the commonalities are, People running scared, uncertainty, how long, how deep. Um, I don't want to catch a falling knife. I don't want to be too early. And yet you don't want to be too late. The difference is each set of situation, you know, each circumstances are, are, are different. You know, whether the RTC crisis, it was heavily supply driven, right? It was a massive supply shock. Uh, there was some demand uh, around the Gulf War One, uh, but demand sort of was tepid. Maybe it was flat, but it was really a supply shock. In the global, in the um, uh, in the 9/11 and dot-com bubble boost, it wasn't really a supply shock; it was a demand shock, right? I mean, when 9/11 happened, demand collapsed. So then it was okay. How quickly are people going to be willing to travel again? I remember hopping on a plane three or four days after, and I was the only one on the plane, along with a a, a rescue dog and a, and a FEMA worker. Uh, and I ended up, uh, I ended up convincing our driver at the time to drive us both down to ground zero. And we, uh, and, and I was sort of talking my through, talking my way through the various checkpoints. Um, and when I had any challenge, I said, I've got a FEMA guy with his dog with me, and which was true. And we're trying to get him down to ground zero. And so, you know, they were like, all right, you pass on through. And we kept going through all the checkpoints. And so I delivered him to ground zero. He was appreciative of it. And, and I was also appreciative of having him uh, sort of giving me cover to get to ground zero and see what it looked like, right? Um, and so, you know, I think in, in, in that case, again, it was a demand collapse and how quickly will people travel in the cap of the global financial crisis, it was really, uh, you know, a capital markets uh, collapse, right? And so it wasn't a massive supply shock. It wasn't a massive demand shock, although it was a demand shock. Uh, but that was really, you know, hey, how are the capital markets going to play themselves out and when will things begin to normalize? So that was a little different. And then COVID was unprecedented, right? I mean, talk about a demand collapse. I remember sitting in the basement of the London House Hotel, one of our Chicago flagships. I think we've done 20 projects in Chicago, 15 of which have been hotels, 12 have been downtown within about a mile and a half radius, and four of them are on Michigan Avenue. And I'm down there with my team and then the governor announces we're shutting it down. And I looked to my team and I said, oh, my goodness, right? This is going to be unprecedented. And demand collapsed overnight uh, at, a, at an unprecedented level. And and so we went into hardcore triage, right? Um, furloughs, salary cuts. I mean, it was pure survival, right? In terms of having to get lean and not knowing how long it would last. And so we made decisions quickly and aggressively, and we communicated like crazy with our teams. Uh, and, you know, we were in the foxhole together, right? As I said to my team, we're all in the foxhole. We got to fight this out. We got to be super communicative, transparent. We got to make decisions quickly, prudently. 
uh, and we'll get through this. And, and that's sort of what we did uh, for the first three months. And then things began to sort of settle down a little bit. And then we're like, wow, how can we help the city of Chicago and some of our other cities and help ourselves at the same time? So I think we volunteered to, uh, to, to offer five of our eight Chicago hotels at the time and three of our four San Francisco hotels to the city to house first responders and, and, you know, police and firemen and nurses and COVID recovery people and hospitals. And I think uh, the mayor of Chicago called us out a couple of times and likewise, San Francisco, they're like, look, Oxford stepped up. Um, you know, some of the big brands and chains were so caught up in, you know, liability and, and other concerns and, you know, big uh, negotiations on contracts. And I just sort of talked with my team, not recklessly, but sort of just said, look, we need to protect ourselves liability wise. We need to make sure we have good contracts, which we did, but we're going to just do this. And, and so sure enough, we did that. And we, I think we're the only five hotels in Chicago that filled up of the eight uh, that we had uh, that filled up during COVID. And not only did we help the city and they called us out and people appreciated it, the policemen, the firemen, et cetera, the nurses, but we cash flowed those hotels right in the middle of COVID for a couple of years. Uh, we did the same thing in San Francisco. So, you know, that was an example of trying to be, you know, how do you create a win-win? How do you do right by your city and offer up uh, accommodations to help people um, at the same time, looking out for ourselves and our investors and how do we do well by them? So I think, you know, we just try to be uh, creative, entrepreneurial, scrappy and, and uh, nimble, uh, but at the same time, sort of very analytical and, and, and data driven in our decisions. What surprised you most about the COVID impact on real estate and what you had to do during those early days? Boy, um, look, I mean, I, again, the, 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 as you know, the canary in the coal mine there was anything having to do with travel or, or, you know, restaurants, you know, car rentals, you know, cruise lines, hotels, airplanes, or, uh, you know, airlines. I mean, they were the true canary in the coal mine. Things, de demand collapsed overnight. And then over time, other industries, you know, felt the pain some more than others and some boomed, right? I mean, Zoom and, you know, some other things that boomed and, and Peloton, et cetera, right? But, uh, a, a lot of companies, uh, felt a lot of pain. Um, and so I think, you know, in that case, what surprised me? Is that your question? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think what's, what surprised me was how, Look, I, I thought relatively, relatively early on, it became clear that the people that were really vulnerable were the elderly or the immune compromised, uh, and that we needed to protect the elderly and the immune compromised. Absolutely. Um, but what surprised me was, you know, the, the effort to completely shut down, uh, you know, the economy, um, I thought it was just over, overwrought. And I, I'm, I'm sure it was well intentioned. Uh, and there was a lot of uncertainty at the time, and I'll acknowledge that. Uh, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback, uh, difficult decisions like that. Um, but I thought it became pretty early on. It became clear that, the, again, the immune compromised and the elderly are the ones who are at risk. And, you know, wearing a mask outdoors when you're running, when no one's around, made absolutely no sense. And so, anyway, I would say what surprised me was how, how thoroughly uh, governments shut down around the world and I was disappointed by the suppression of alternative views. Um, you know, I believe in open discourse and civilized discourse and, and I want to hear a point, point and counterpoint uh, and, you know, be very data driven, very science driven and research driven, but also listen to sort of, you know, smart perspectives on both sides. And I felt like there were really thoughtful, intelligent people uh, that were calling out um, some hypocrisy, some hypocrisy and calling out some extremism, uh, and that they were denounced as uh, providing misinformation, which I thought was unfair. Although there was plenty of misinformation flying around too, let's be clear. Do you think that's permanently changed the way you're going to think about investing going forward in any way? Well, I, look, I think to be honest with you, I think, you know, we once, you know, once burned, uh, you know, uh, you fool me once, right? Uh, shame on, shame on me, fool me twice, or shame on you, or vice versa, fool, shame on you, and then shame on me, right? So I think that, you know, if and when we get the next uh, pandemic, which we'll, we'll get, I just, I don't, I don't think the, the global economy will, will ever, will ever react the way we reacted. I think we learned a lot of hard lessons. And I don't think the governments will try to do what they did. And I don't think people will accept it if the governments do try to do what they did. I think people will 
Uh, so I think we've learned a, a hard lesson that way, uh, you know, the hard way. And so I think it'll be a more moderated response, responsible, thoughtful, uh, but more moderated response um, so that people can carry on with their lives and make independent decisions. I think that's uh, one of the big learnings um, from this uh, tragedy of, of what happened in COVID. One of the things that I was most surprised about is how long it took for some of our properties to recover and some of them are still recovering. And the other thing that I thought was so interesting, and you would see this because you own various types of real estate, but I'd have investors coming to me that maybe are multifamily owners or investors, and they're looking at me like I'm doing something wrong. Like, how are you guys not, you know, killing it right now? We're having the best year ever. You know, our apartments are up 20%, this, that, and the other thing. And it was like a, a tale of two cities in some markets where hotels were completely disconnected in certain markets from what was going on with the economy, maybe in that market or more broadly speaking. Yeah, no, I think it's a good comment. A, a couple of things. First of all, I would just acknowledge or I would point out that there absolutely were some secular shifts happening pre-COVID that then got accelerated through COVID, right? Just sort of this hybrid work environment and uh, you know, more remote work in major urban markets, um, you know, that, that was a secular shift that was happening and then it got accelerated. Um, and, and, and travel, you know, the, the sort of business travel and the Zoom, right? Zoom is, is here to stay. As I always say, Zoom is much better than just a phone call. It's not as good as in person, but it's a nice in between. And there are absolutely times when it makes sense to Zoom. There are times when it makes sense to do a phone call or to make a, a, to make a trip. So I think there were a couple of secular changes by virtue of the sort of the Zoom dimension and the uh, secular shift in sort of remote working uh, that got accelerated during COVID. So coming out of COVID, uh, you, you know, there are certain cities that obviously the drive to leisure markets really boomed. Right. And, uh, and a lot of the big urban centers got hammered. And and so I would say one of my observations was certainly you have to be aware of those secular trends and adjust accordingly. And we certainly have had a large variance in terms of recovery trajectories and recovery velocities across the country in our various markets, right? Some Boston, you know, has come back really strong. New York's coming back strong. Florida obviously has been on fire. Uh, you know, each market is a little different. LA, you know, San Francisco, Bay Area, Portland, Seattle, more challenging. Minneapolis getting hammered. You know, Detroit's coming strongly, Chicago's coming back, but it's not there yet. So there's been a broad range depending on the mix, right? Um, and, you know, Chicago's sort of 40% group and 30% transient, 30% leisure historically, uh, right? And, and group business shut down and, 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 and a lot of the sort of business travel shut down. So it got hit pretty hard as many of the urban centers did. Um, although it's come back a long way, it's not that there fully. Uh, the group business is back strongly. Leisure is quite strong, but the individual business traveler, while growing, uh, the smaller and mid-sized businesses, the big corporate travelers aren't traveling the way they were. And the question is, will leisure and leisure sort of backfill? Some analysts think that, you know, if they're, if you're going to get back to 75 or 85 percent of the former business travel, you're going to be 115 percent uh, with leisure and leisure. And so net, the demand will be similar with group being similar because people do like to gather. Time will tell how that plays out. I mean, Bill Gates said 50% of, you know, business travel is over for good. I didn't, you know, look, he's a brilliant guy and I have a lot of respect for his accomplishments and his brain. Um, I think that's a little extreme. Um, I feel like, you know, our, our instinct was sort of 75 to 85% of the business travel comes back, um, depending on the month, depending on the market group, uh, mostly, if not completely comes back, people do really like to gather, but all the group meetings will be hybrid. There'll be a lot of people in person, but they'll also have a Zoom option. And then leisure, there's definitely a growing percentage of people who have disposable income who like to travel and experiences are more valuable than things, right? Um, and so I think more than ever, people recognize that and view travel as sort of a, a right and something they really enjoy uh, for their mental health and their social being and so on. So I think we're net reasonably bullish that sort of medium to long term even though the demand pie will change in terms of the mix, that the overall travel demand will come back uh, pretty strongly. 
but some markets, it's going to be a long journey back, right? I mean, Minneapolis and Seattle and Portland and, you know, some of the San Francisco, um, even though we are believers in San Francisco, medium to long term, it's one of the great American cities. And we think it will ultimately come back. It always has. And we think it will again, but it's going to be a longer slog this way. So it's a been a, a very wide band of, you know, recovery, some very quickly, some quite anemic and, and everywhere in between. Some will be two or three years. Some will be five, six, seven, eight years, right? During the 80s and 90s, a lot of ugly hotels got built. I would say like commodity, big box group hotels. You've really specialized in historic assets, whether they were a hotel or an office building. But you've also made bets in markets like Chicago, San Francisco, Detroit with amazing architecture, but can have some challenges in the in the short term. How are you thinking about like identifying and executing on some of these unique investments in the face of challenging local market? Put another way, you have the opportunity to buy a trophy asset that you know everyone's always going to think is beautiful and people probably are going to want to associate with the beautiful asset. But how do you convince yourself to make the bet in that market given maybe what's going on in the market? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a fair question. And, and um, you know, the, the, the sort of, the, I always sort of the, the point and the counterpoint, right? Sort of here's the glass half full, here's the glass half empty, right? I mean, there are, and we are always weighing that around every opportunity, right? Uh, what are all the things that we like about it that intrigue us? And what are the counterpoints to what we don't like or are concerned about? Like in the case of during COVID, you know, we bought the Westin Book Cadillac in downtown Detroit. The Book Cadillac is like the plaza uh, of Detroit or the Drake, uh, you know, in Chicago. It's, it's sort of an iconic asset. Um, and we, we bought it in a distressed, uh, sort of foreclosure, uh, where we, you know, assumed and restructured an existing CMBS loan that was super attractively priced, you know, 4.35% interest rate long term. And, uh, but we had to step in and, and complete a PIP because the project had had been 15 years since it had been pipped and reopened, having been shut down for 25 years as an empty building. So. We stepped in and I think our view was, look, part of the arbitrage, part of the opportunity is not everybody will look at Detroit, right? And and so we're going to have less competition. Uh, we'll be able to buy it at a more attractive yield, a deeper discount, et cetera. Uh, and yet Detroit's a, a real American city and the bankruptcy that happened in 2013 was the best thing that could have happened to them. They restructured their debts. They right-sized their cost structure against their revenue. And, and then that allowed them to begin climbing out of their uh, deep, uh, deep downturn. And it's going to take a long time to bring it fully back. But a lot of very successful families live in Detroit, Metro Detroit, and are believing in it and betting on it. And while Ford and GM and, and Chrysler's successor, you know, are no longer the three biggest in the world, they're still big time companies, right? And there's a lot of commerce and a lot of business that happens in and around Detroit. It's a real city. There's a lot of innovation. So you know, less efficient market, less competition, deep distress. A lot of people wouldn't touch it. All that meant was really compelling opportunity as long as we structured it properly, priced it properly and underwrote it properly, which we believe we have done. Um, and so I think, you know, that's been our mantra, whether buying in San Francisco in the middle of COVID or buying in Chicago in the middle of COVID or any number of other markets where we acquired or developed or we also were building the apartment buildings and we built a, a brand new Godfrey Hotel in Detroit. We've got five projects in Detroit, who would have guessed, right? One of which was an acquisition, four of which are developments, both hotel and multifamily and parking and retail. And and so I think, you know, our view was um, let's be independent thinkers. Let's underwrite conservatively. Let's be very data driven. Uh, let's be highly rational in our approach to underwriting. Um, and let's look at all the glass F full dimensions. Let's look at the glass F empty dimensions, weigh them. And if we, uh, if we feel the glass F holes is far, far more weighting than the glass F empty, we'll step up. And, and that's generally served as well. Likewise, San Francisco, we bought, you know, a portfolio of assets to right near Stanford Research Park and in, in, in Silicon Valley. And our belief is that Silicon Valley is one of the great American franchises, right? I mean, it's the innovation epicenter of America, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, innovation happens everywhere throughout the U.S. And, and around the world, but that truly is one of America's great franchises. And so buying two assets right near Stanford and Stanford Research Park uh, during the middle of COVID, we really liked. 
And then in downtown San Francisco, one of the Embarcadero, two right at Union Square, we're like, look, as long as we buy them cheaply enough, we capitalize them conservatively enough, and we underwrite more like a seven-year recovery, um, then, you know, hopefully we'll end up looking like, uh, you know, if we're lucky, pretty smart. Um, and if not, uh, you know, um, then so be it. But I think, you know, we're willing to sort of have the courage of our convictions and again, if we capitalize conservatively, underwrite conservatively, longer term recoveries, uh, properly sort of calibrating for equity, a reduced leverage, et cetera, all of those things give us comfort. And frankly, we've been doing it now, you know, for a long time. So when a new black swan event emerges, uh, you know, we have a lot of existing investors that have backed us over many years and many cycles. And we also have others that we've been talking to that say, we want to do stuff with you. And we say, okay, we're putting the band back together. We're going to go on offense again. Um, you know, they thankfully we've been around a long time, and then uh, knock on wood, we have a little institutional credibility to to sort of doing what we're saying we're going to do, and we underwrite them together, and we ultimately come to a conclusion that these things make sense. For those investing in San Francisco right now, what are they seeing that others aren't? Well, look, I think, and look, there are a lot of people that are, have written it off and that are, you know, that are saying it's not going to ever come back, or if it does, it's going to take a decade or more and, you know, whatever. And, and they may be right. Um, but I, um, I think the people that are stepping up are saying, look, um, it's historically been uh, one of, if not the highest barrier to entry submarket in the country. It really, Boston, San Francisco, and Waikiki Beach, right, have been the sort of three highest barrier to entry markets. Very little new supply, hard to get stuff entitled. And that's both good and bad, right? I mean, that's part of why they have such housing crisis and so on. And the whole NIMBY thing has is, is really uh, come back to bite them on, on many levels. But so super high barriers to entry, very little new supply, shrinking supply. And it's one of the great American cities, right? And sure enough, AI is starting to lease space in downtown San Francisco. And guess what? People are, can get rent in downtown San Francisco for materially cheaper than they could, you know, pre-COVID. And markets work. Right. Adjustments happen. If rents used to be seven thousand a month and now they're, you know, four thousand a month in some you know, asset, there are a lot more people that say I can move in downtown San Francisco and I can live and work there. And if the AI companies say we need three hundred thousand square feet of space, we need to be near public transportation. We need to be at the epicenter of things to sort of attract people. Then they're going to take space in downtown San Francisco. So I think I think uh, the investors, including us whether there are people, there are starting to be bids for buying office buildings, right? The deep, deep discounts. But, you know, people are saying, look, if there's a $400 million office building that I can buy for $80 million and I could buy it at 30% of replacement costs and I can totally reprice my rents and dramatically undercut the market and still get a very attractive return, that's compelling because ultimately San Francisco is one of the great American cities and the pendulum will swing back. They're going to start arresting more criminals and putting them in jail, which is what they should do. Um, and they're going to you know, not tolerate as much homeless uh, tragedy and drug addiction and so on on the streets and the common areas of the, of the city. And the pendulum will swing and it'll swing enough that the demand will come back. Uh, and those that were you know, aggressive and, and proactive and had the courage of their convictions hopefully reap the rewards. And so I think the people that, you know, the people that are betting on that just are betting on that medium to long term recovery, but capitalizing their projects super conservatively, all equity or, or big chunks of equity with very little debt, low leverage with, again, long runways, you know, three, five, seven, 10 years, even, you know, recoveries and saying I can buy so cheaply. I think those people, including us, are making that bet. And, and knock on wood, I think San Francisco has turned. I think it's bottomed. I think it's plateaued. And we're seeing some encouraging early signs. It's a long way from normal. It's got a long way to climb back. Uh, but we're seeing some encouraging signs, including AI companies leasing office space and distressed office trades happening. When trades start to happen, a bottoming occurs. It happens in every market. Gold, diamonds, real estate, right? You name it. Stocks, bonds. And, and that's beginning to happen. So that's forming a bottom. Uh, and I think you're going to see that in a lot of markets, a lot of distressed office trades that will be forming bottoms. The other big uh, compelling thing, you know, you asked about what I what I like or maybe, you know, what I like now. To me, I said the, the most compelling opportunities right now are deep discounts on big box urban assets. 
It's buying the super tankers, right? It's buying the thousand room, fifteen hundred room, two thousand room super tankers in all the big, big, big markets: Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A. It's buying them at deep discounts, deep, deep discounts. They're all defaulted. And, you know, buying at 20, 30, 40 cents on the dollar and then underwriting a five to seven year group recovery and transient recovery and leisure recovery. I think those are going to be the most compelling trades of all. I want to hang there because that's actually not what I thought you were going to say. And and pretty interesting. There's been a couple of trades in New York City. There was like the big Hilton in Times Square and the Sheridan. And these are these massive super tankers that you're talking about, like thousand room hotels, built in the 80s, you know, they were shut down during COVID. They need a massive amount of capital. Why is that style of hotel still an opportunity? Today? Yeah, I think, look, I mean, I, and again, we do a lot of luxury lifestyle product. We have extended stay. We, you know, we've got high end and upper, upper mid scale. Most of our stuff is sort of four to four and three quarter star, but we've done some select service and extended stay in the three and a half category and done some super luxury. Um, Look, I, I think there, there's no doubt that sort of more technologically sophisticated and, and newer, nicer architecture, whatever, those assets are, are increasingly compelling and they're getting some pretty high per key trades happening now in resort markets and some urban markets in, in luxury and super luxury assets. But look, at the end of the day, in, in these big cities, you know, the, the, you know, the New Yorks, the Chicago's, the Boston's, the, the DC's, Philly, even LA, San Francisco, some of these big cities, um, there are massive convention calendars and people meet and, you know, the, you, you, you'd be amazed at how many different types of meetings happen in these cities. And as I like to say, you know, Hugo, Homo sapien is a highly social creature, right? And we like to gather in people uh, in person and and compare notes and see people. And it's a warmer, closer connection. And that helps facilitate commerce and trade and, and, and interactions and relationships. And so in my mind, those big box hotels, if you buy them cheaply enough, and they're almost all branded, you're going to have to execute a big pip like we did the Westin Book Cadillac, right? We spent 20 million plus doing a pip, totally modernizing it. New technology, you know, beautiful new you know, bedding and wallpaper and new lobbies and technology, all sorts of things. So it feels really fresh and new and nice, even though it sits within this elegant hundred year old box. And so that has had new plumbing and electrical and all the rest during its retrofit 15 years ago. So I think the same thing will happen with these big super tankers in San Francisco and L.A. and New York and Chicago, where like the Palmer House Hilton. Right. I think ultimately there'll be a massive pip required by the brands, but that'll be taken into account by buyers like us who will then say, OK, I can buy this at 30 cents on the dollar and then I'm going to spend another 20 cents on the dollar doing a you know 50 million dollar pip at the Palmer House or something. And I'm going to have, you know, fresh, new, nice product that sits within these elegant Grace Kelly bones of a building. Um, and I'm going to be able to compete quite effectively with some of the newer, fresher product because I've got a brand new PIP. And my basis is a lot less than theirs. Uh, and I've got, you know, 150,000 square feet of meeting space. I can accommodate all sorts of different groups and users at the same time and ballrooms and sweet 16s and weddings. And so I think that those boxes will continue to be compelling. The other thing that's interesting is that, um, you know, the denominator has shrunk in some of these markets, as you know, um, by virtue of being converted to apartments because we're totally under, you know, under apartmented in most of the major urban markets. So some of them are converting to apartments. Others, obviously, in the near term, you know, migrant, uh, you know, uh, shelters. Uh, and so the denominator has shrunk uh, in many of these big urban markets. Uh, there's very little new supply that is coming in or that will come in because the math just doesn't work between construction costs and interest rates and just all in replacement costs. So I think you're in for a three to five year run of very little new supply, shrinking supply in many cases and or and, and very little new supply being added to the shrinking supply and demand recovery, uh, you know, tra tracking with GDP growth. And so I think that'll be a pretty compelling uh, thesis here over the next three to five years. Not the only one, but certainly one of them. Now, that may be not where, you know, Jake, you know, you and I like to stay in luxury lifestyle hotels and and stylish sort of boutique -y hotels. Many of us like that. And I enjoy that, too. Um, but, you know, there are big box hotels that house a lot of people uh, that are there for business or travel or family or whatever, or that also fill a very important niche. So let's talk about the places 
that you've spent a lot of time building brands on. And you have a couple brands and they mostly kind of sit in this luxury lifestyle segment. Why is that such an appealing investment and strategy for you in those markets that you operate? Yeah, look, I think our view was that, you know, pretty early on, whether it was Kimpton or Joie de Vivre or some of the earlier Schrager, right, they were onto something. Uh, Although, you know, people say they created the Boutique or Lifestyle brand. I remind people that, you know, the Plaza was a brand of one uh, for many years and the George Sank and all that, right? All hotels used to be sort of one-off boutique hotels, right? And then and then when Marriott and Hilton and Holiday Inn and others came along, they created these chains and these brands in quotes, right? So the boutique independent hotel has been around for hundreds of years and will be around. But clearly, once things got super chain focused, particularly in the U.S. with the, the big, the, the Marriott's, the Hilton's, and again, the Holiday Inn's, et cetera, there was a lot of sort of branded product. And then there was a little bit of a backlash uh, and sort of an innovation that some of the guys, the Bill Kimpton and, and, and Chip Conley at Joie de Vivre and, and, and Ian Schrager and others were doing these boutique and lifestyle products. Just it's a more bespoke, more unique, more customized lack of, you know, it's not a cookie cutter product. So I think that was something that was a growing segment as I got into the space uh, and into the business, investing and owning and managing hotels. So I saw that evolution happen. I also related to it myself. Those are sort of the kind of assets that I like to stay in. Uh, and then I began to see some institutional acceptance, both on the debt side and the equity side, where there were more and more lenders that were open to lending to an independent hotel and more equity investors willing to invest in. Whereas historically, and there's still this uh, bias toward big chain affiliation because it's a sort of a, a bit of an insurance policy for an investor. Um, there's still that bias and, and rightly so to some degree, but the internet really democratized access to the global distribution systems. And it really leveled the playing field much more for the independents to compete with the big chain affiliated properties. So when that began to happen, uh, that confluence of events drove us to start buying and developing and redeveloping product of our own. And, you know, we pride ourselves in being agnostic, Jake, around we, whatever is the value optimizing business plan for the real estate is what we will do. You know, we have pure play independence. We have soft branded assets. We have co-branded assets. We have hard branded assets, right? Whatever we think the value optimizing choice is, is what our business plan will be. In the case of buying the Weston Book Cadillac, Weston's a great brand. It's affiliated with Marriott. You know, we didn't, if it isn't broken, don't fix it. Uh, in the case of, you know, we create our own brands, the Godfrey Hotel brand, we're growing around the country. London House, we created a flagship in Chicago. We're going to grow that into other markets. Julian, uh, we're already growing into San Francisco and we'll likely grow that into other markets. So those are pure play, uh, sort of our own lifestyle brands. But we also own Thompson's and, as I said, Weston's and Hyatt's and Hilton's and, and Curio Collections and Autographs uh, and other uh, similar kind of brands. Uh, soft brands or hard branded assets and La Meridian, et cetera, where we think that's the value optimizing choice. But I think in terms of these lifestyle brands, I think our view was that you could get a premium in ADR. You had less of a rate ceiling because you were a little less pigeonholed, right? If you sort of think of a given asset, okay, this is, uh, you know, a, a Weston. And then, by the way, that's a very upscale, nice brand. But a Weston isn't going to get the same rate as a Ritz Carlton or maybe as a JW. And, then, you know, there's the whole sort of spectrum. When you have an independent lifestyle hotel, it's a little bit harder to quantify in a good way. Right. And so there's no implicit rate ceiling. Um, and for that matter, floor. I mean, you, you, so I think our view is you could be a little more entrepreneurial in driving ADR and pushing for a true luxury kind of rate, but maybe having a cost structure that's more uh, luxury light and so better margins. Still good service, still good guest scores, but maybe not just over the top guest scores or over the top service, but over the top margins because you're not staffing it or overstaffing it the way super luxury hotels are staffed. So to us, that was sort of a good niche, the four and a half to four and three quarter star luxury lifestyle, primarily urban um, and, and where we could really push the ADR, manage the cost structure uh, more efficiently and really drive margin. And also we loved uh, the food and beverage component, right? We build, take a great pride in sort of having really dynamic rooftops, bars, lounges, uh, and, 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 and our rooftops become real destinations. And so our F&B team 
uh, really you know, takes pride in great programming. You know, you super unique Kentucky Derby parties, not the normal stuff. Of course, the normal stuff. I mean, that's St. Patrick's Day and Mother's Day. We do all that stuff, of course. And we try to do a really good job. But we also do a lot of really creative out of the box things. You know, Halloween, Halloween sleep overnights. And again, Kentucky Derby parties that are over the top and things like that. So a lot of really creative programming in the local market. Uh, and then, and then driving uh, top line uh, through social media and revenue management, and then managing the flow through by managing our food costs and our beverage costs and our labor costs, so that we can really flow food and beverage and make it profitable. Whenever we can, we'll lease out the three meal a day restaurant. Oftentimes, uh, you know, a three meal a day restaurant tour, uh, a local sharpshooter can run a really tight ship, and I, we'd rather have them pay us rent. As long as we've got a synchronistic uh, relationship with them because they are in our hotel, frequently we'll have a three meal a day leased out, but then we'll manage, we'll self-manage the banquets, the catering, the bars, the lounges, and the rooftops. Sometimes we'll self-manage the three meal a day restaurant, particularly if it's sort of in, embedded in our lobby, where it's sort of the lobby and the, and the, and the F&B is sort of all one. And that's hard to sort of outsource that to a third party operator if you're managing the the whole asset. So in some circumstances, we'll do that. But in many cases, we'll bifurcate them and do that. Can you share some of the mistakes you've made around food and beverage or third-party leases? Because it's so tough. Yeah, look, I mean, I look, I, I think, I mean, it sounds cliche. I, I would just say that, um, look, there are some some of these big group houses, 50% of the revenue is food and beverage. I mean, literally, you look at some of these, you know, the, the, the big, big box 200,000 square feet of meeting space and, you know, with between banquets and catering and group and bars and 10 different outlets. I mean, literally half the revenue is F and B. So you better know how to make money in F and B. But I would say we try to focus on the, the, the B part of F and B a lot more, right? So booze and banquets where we can, you know, get higher margin, more efficient labor. That's where we really focus. Uh, and then if we have to manage the, the F side, uh, the food side, um, you know, we try to keep a more limited menu so that it's more efficient to sort of to staff, more efficient to cook and to get flow through. Uh, but in terms of mistakes we've made, look, I'm sure we've made many of the same mistakes that most people have made, you know, which is at times having a more complicated menu than we should have. And, you know, sometimes our chefs will, you know, the artiste and the chef will uh, will say we want to do all these great things. And we are pretty quick to say, look, we need to have a practical side here. You're an artist, but you're also a, a cook and a chef, and we've got to make money with this, or you're not going to be around, and we're not going to be around. Show me the burger. So I would say, I would say, if there's a mistake that we've made that we learned early on is that you know make sure you control your your chef and your programming in terms of menu selections um, and food costs and beverage costs and staffing. And I would say recognizing that you know in quotes celebrity chefs or sort of high visibility chefs. Uh, frequently have uh, come with a fair amount of baggage um, and it's usually not worth it. Now that doesn't mean there aren't fantastic chefs and some superstar chefs out there that aren't great and know how to run really great top line, but also how to flow it through. So it's no disrespect to them, but more often than not, you know, give me a, a steady, solid, really capable chef who's not as high profile, who can work with our teams in crafting a really prudent menu and can run a really smart F and B program that we found to be the best overall formula a long term. Is there anything that comes to mind? Because I'm like thinking about what you said, where you kind of have a five star product, but you're cutting away some of the service. So maybe it's four and a half, four and three quarters. What are some of those items that like the smart boutique hoteliers are just throwing away and pushing to the side that the luxury guys have to do that? you are doing that's then not sacrificing the product yeah look and i would say you know in fairness you know the product didn't call it you know four and a half to four and three quarter star right i mean it, you know it may be just nipping at the heels of the true luxury five star in terms of fits and finishes but pretty close uh but but the staff more like a four star right which is you know just just a leaner a leaner everywhere right a little leaner at the front desk a little leaner in the in, in the at the bar a little leaner in in you know banquets and catering and just a more efficient utilization and cross-referencing jobs people pitching in the you know the manager will valet a car if he has to i mean just you know things like that where you're more hey look we're all in this we want sort of decathletes in here figuring out how to be effective and not being so tied to this is the only job i do right so trying to craft 
uh, an entrepreneurial sort of decathlete mindset on the part of our employees. Uh, and then trying to staff, you know, each of the departments a little more leanly, recognizing that people have to do sort of multiple tasks, um, but compensating them for that productivity, right? In other words, you know, recognizing and creating incentive plans that compensate for not just top line, but profitability. And so by doing that in our F&B teams and our front desk teams and our, you know, parking teams and so on, we're able to sort of get creative on the ground solutions that allow us to run more efficient, profitable operations. So, you know, I look, and by the way, I'm speaking in the US mostly, obviously overseas, labor is so inexpensive in some of the Asian markets and some of the other markets where they can afford to have just over the top staffing ratios in their luxury or even less than luxury hotels and still have good profits because labor is so relatively inexpensive. But in the more mature markets of the U.S. and Canada and Europe and you know Western Europe, and uh, it's really hard to staff at the level that the super luxury staff and to make a good margin. You may get a great top line, but rarely is it a good margin. And that's why I always say it's rare that you find a super luxury hotel that was a really good investment for its initial investors, unless it was attached to high end residential sales. Right? If it was attached it was a Waldorf or a St. Regis or a Four Seasons or a Ritz and residences and they you know, that allow them to sell their residential real estate their condos in the you know for 20 or villas 20 30 35 percent premium to if they didn't have the brand attached and dramatically buy down the basis of the remnant or residual hotel then your basis is dramatically lower and you may be able to make that a successful real estate investment but a standalone sort of true super luxury hotel, as an investment is rarely a good investment for the first investor group. They're usually purchased after the fact, and sometimes they become good investments for the second or third investor group, but not always. You have this amazing hotel called the London House in Chicago, and it's a great real estate and development story, but it's also a good round trip story. Could you share that one with us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I, I'm a, a great lover of real estate, also a great lover of architecture. I actually was the chairman of the Chicago Architecture Foundation, now the Chicago Architecture Center um, until recently. I have a deep, deep love and affection. As I said, it, you grow up in Chicago, you like high rises, right? Um, and, you know, you grow up in Canada, you like hockey, right? I mean, it's uh, it's sort of what we do. And and so at London House, the London Guarantee and Accident Building is one of the big four at the Michigan Avenue Bridge, the Wrigley Building the Tribune Tower, the London Guarantee and Accident Building, and then a building called 333 North Michigan, which is the only one which doesn't have a corporate name attached, which the Words family of Blackhawks fame owns. And uh, those big four at the Michigan Avenue Bridge have been iconic for 100 years sitting there, right? But this building uh, was falling on hard times, right? It was, uh, the, you know, the, the facade was falling off, the windows needed to be replaced, mechanical, electrical, most of the tenants had moved out. It had really been limping along. Um, and so I looked at it and said, you know, wow, uh, this is this is a true Grace Kelly building. Beautiful bones, beautiful positioning. It's in so many historic pictures of Chicago. As you come south on Michigan Avenue across the bridge, there it sits looking at you. Beautifully proportioned. And I said, wow, this could be a really neat luxury lifestyle hotel. And let's get, sink our teeth into it. So long and short of it is it was owned by a New York investor group. Uh, they were running a New York style uh, closing, which is no listing agent and, uh, you know, show up with a contract and $5 million of non-refundable earnest money and maybe we'll talk. Right. And so we spent a lot of time uh, because we had done so many projects in Chicago, including so many adaptive reuse projects, including the IBM building across the street, which became the Langham. We put our team together and did a lot of upfront due diligence, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, architectural, programming, entitlement, zoning, all of that. We did a lot of upfront work, sort of spec the time and effort, and then did a very detailed zero-based underwriting on the development, the performance, the construction, the operation. And then we saw there was a vacant parking lot next door, and we said, gosh, we could probably build, you know, 100 more rooms and another 21-story tower there, and that'll help us reduce our basis, help us do a two-story ballroom without columns, add up, make our rooftop bigger. So we just kept doing the work. We spent a lot of time and effort. And then I was nurturing the relationship with the seller. And 
And uh, they checked us out and they said, yeah, well, actually, these guys have done a lot of projects in Chicago as well as other places, but they're based here. They've done a half a dozen adaptive reuses within a five block radius. They're credible. Uh, we hear they're good people. They're honest. They're hardworking. They do what they say they're going to do. So, you know, your reputation follows yourself. As I, my father said, you know, you spend the first half of your year, uh, first half of your life working for your name. And if you're lucky, the second half of your life, your name works for you. Right. And so they checked us out and uh, and they said, OK, we you guys are probably our first choice as the buyer. You've done a lot of homework. Uh, so here's the price. And uh, and I said, well, you know, the price last week was, you know, was this and now it's higher. And they kept moving on us. But we showed up with a with a live contract and a five million dollar earnest money check uh, with our uh, we and our institutional partner that began uh, uh, looking at the deal together. And and he kept moving around on us. But he ended up I convinced him that, hey, look, this is a big number. This is a good price. We're ready to move quickly. You've been thinking about this for a long time. Let's make it happen. And so in the end, we shook hands. We signed the contract. We moved to a quick closing. And uh, and then we executed the comprehensive sort of $200 million plus redevelopment. You know, we changed 1,500 rooms, new mechanical, new electrical, replaced the roof, and then built a rooftop, built a 21-story addition on, on Wacker Drive uh, at 85 East Wacker, which became the new entrance, which allowed us to do a two-story, again, column-free ballroom. And then we started talking to institutional lenders and capital partners. And then we started talking about end capital partners. And at the front end, as we were getting closer to opening it, we began nurturing a relationship with a big offshore investor group, Union out of Germany and uh, Union Real Estate, which is, you know, syndicates a lot of retail capital throughout Germany. Um, I actually spoke German as a kid, learned it in, in school. I, I spoke a little Deutsch with them, which probably didn't hurt. <laughs> Uh, I don't think it was pivotal, but but that didn't hurt. And and we began talking about it. And actually, to, to, to answer your question around London House, we had just finished a sale lease management back at the Godfrey Boston with Union, which I believe was their first uh, such investment in the U.S. in the hotel space. And so we'd had a very successful outcome there. It was a win-win. We round tripped and did a sale lease management back did very well for ourselves and our investors. But Union also got a great asset. It's performing extremely well to this day. And so we said, we've got an even bigger, even higher profile asset in London House and the London Guarantee Building in Chicago. And we educated them on the opportunity and uh, they got excited about it and came with waves of people doing very thorough due diligence. And the long and short of it is we did a sale lease management back with that asset that we did sort of six weeks before opening. And so when we opened, uh, it was a win-win, uh, right? It was a, certainly a grand slam for us and our investors um, as Godfrey Boston was and, and, and many of our other projects have been. Um, but it was also a great win for them. They got one of the most iconic assets in the U.S., in Chicago and, and arguably the U.S. at North Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive. They, they put it on the cover of one of their uh, annual reports. Uh, and it's been a top performer uh, ever since, right? So uh, that was, you know, a, a proud development. It won redevelopment of the year. I think it won the Alice, uh, you know, Hotel Investment of the Year uh, for that year or whatever. It won all sorts of awards, but I look, I, you know, to me, the awards are more, it's, it's for our team, right? It's, it's exciting. Our team gets excited to be able to say this one development of the year and transaction of the year and, you know, number one hotel and trip advisor and the number one rooftop and all these great things. That's great for our operational team to be able to take pride in the asset, take pride in the company, uh, and then evangelize that through social media to drive more demand. And we, we really do try to look for win-wins. We obviously want to do really well as an investor, developer, sponsor. Uh, but when we recap an asset or refinance or do a sale lease management back, we also want to do right by the next group. Um, and so we frequently will stay in uh, for the long term in a management or lease structure. And we have a new investor base to satisfy. And so we go out of our way to make sure we're delivering for them too. So look, that's one of, you know, we've done a lot of transactions over a lot of years. Uh, but that's certainly one of the ones that we're particularly proud of, Jake. How does the sale lease management back work? Well, um, you ultimately, you sell the bricks and mortar, right? And then you sign a long-term lease and management and branding contract in this case, because London House is our brand, although that particular asset is affiliated with Curio Collection by Hilton, right? So there's an example where we created a brand of one, London House, around that asset. But we felt, we and our institutional partner and our lender felt, look, in that case, it's 450 rooms. It's a gut redevelopment, zero cash flow, older building. is It's a high beta deal. And so let's add, 
let's chain affiliate this. Let's add the Curio collection by Hilton. Hilton was underrepresented. They were anxious to get Curio on such an iconic asset. We've worked very closely with Hilton and their team for many years. And so they were great to work with, entrepreneurial. And so we probably got better debt pricing. We got probably better equity pricing by virtue of doing that, probably reduced the risk of the investment. So in that case, London House, the brand, but Curio Collection by Hilton is the chain affiliation. And um, that combination uh, has been a real win-win in terms of optimizing the performance of that asset. Jake, what was your question? Yeah, so if you lease it back, then do you as the operator keep all the upside? Yeah, so so no. So so we lease, we sign a you know, we sign a fixed lease, we sort of say, hey, here we sell it, and then we sign a lease payment. There's a base rental that we pay as a lease payment, not on not unlike how you might pay a mortgage. And then there's usually a participation, right? So over and above the base payment, if for certain performance thresholds, we'll negotiate paying additional sort of percentage rent, if you will, to the landlord. Uh, and but we'll also get a percentage of that. So we as the manager sponsor, lessee, have every incentive to continue to optimize cash flow because uh, we get a percentage of that additional cash flow over and above the base rent. But a big chunk of that additional cash flow over and above the base rent goes appropriately to the landlord. How do you think about the management company and the investment company? Obviously, you want to grow both. And with a lot of the assets that you're buying, it'll likely be worth more the longer you hold it. But for some investors, you have to sell it. So how do you kind of reconcile those challenges with losing management contracts, losing an asset when you'd be fine staying in, but an investor wants to sell? How, how do you handle all that? Yeah, look, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we've got to do right by our investors. And so, you know, we, you know, if the right thing to do, look, our, our optimal outcome, we'll always say this, right, is that our optimal outcome is we acquire, develop, redevelop, reposition, and then you know, execute some sort of leverage recap or sale, a sale leaseback. That's our optimal outcome where we literally do really well by our existing investor base who took the most risk in a deep turnaround or a development or redevelopment. But then we stay in as the sponsor and manager for the next leg of the journey where the development risk and operational ramp up risk is, is behind us. And now it's about, you know, stabilizing it and keeping it sustainably stabilized. Um, that's our optimal and we make that clear. But look, you can't always pull that off, right? So there are times when you've reached a, a time where, hey, look, it's a hot market and you've created a lot of value through the development and ramp up and you've got to optimize and monetize that value. And we have a responsibility to do that. So we'll hire a broker, we'll interview a brokers. We've got a lot of great relationships and, and we'll hire one to go run a process and, and we'll say, look, our preference is to stay in as the manager and we are believers in the asset. And we'd like to stay in as an investor as well in maybe the next round. Um, but if the, you know, the ultimate buyer, uh, doesn't want to keep us in as the manager and or, you know, have us in as the equity, if they're of the highest price and the best terms, we have a responsibility to take it. And we do. And so certainly there are times when we you know, reluctantly part with an asset, although we do so, you know, uh, proudly if it's a good outcome and, and we're doing right by our investors. Um, and we try not to fall in love with any given asset, but you know, we, we, whenever we can, we try to stay in long term through, again, a leverage recap, sell lease management back, refinancing. Sometimes we, we, we sell and we move on. Sometimes we sell and they keep us because they're like, wow, you really know this asset well, and we're not married up with any particular management company. And therefore we want you to stay. But in other cases, we just have to move on and that's life. And that's, you know, all of our peers deal with the same thing, right? Um, but our, you know, our management, you know, we, we really pride ourselves as owners and investors first, and, and we created a management company around both the, the, the lodging sector, Oxford Hotels and Resorts, and the senior housing, Oxford Living. We really pride ourselves in having an owner mentality. That is our DNA, right? So it's very focused on returns and investment and very granular, very data-driven, and really optimizing cash flow, optimizing value, and thinking like an owner, which is really our DNA and who we are. And so our management teams are heavily focused on that. So we're getting more and more growth in our third-party management business too. They're like, we love that you guys are owners first and sort of managers second. Um, and that, you know, I've got a great team around me that have lived and breathed the management and operational side for, you know, for a long time, their entire careers. Um, but we're growing our third-party management business and selectively our branding business as well. 
um, and, you know, whenever we can. And, and that's, I think, playing pretty well in the marketplace. I think one of the other things that's um, resonating is that, you know, some of our peer firms are so big now. Uh, and look, kudos to them. They've been very successful, right? They created massive uh, management companies. Uh, but, you know, they're the victims of their own success to some degree as well, where you become so big and so layered that, you know, you by definition, you can't be as as hands-on at every deal and every situation as you were when you had 30 or 40 or 50 assets, if you now have 300 or 500 or 1,000. And so, you know, we try to play in that, you know, we're certainly well above the mom and pop and we do large scale transactions, but we're still pretty hungry, pretty hungry and nimble and entrepreneurial and the senior attention of the senior principal still gets devoted to our, you know, management clients and our investor clients and the assets themselves. So we really try to leverage that and uh, and sort of differentiate ourselves that way. In addition to, again, super sophisticated revenue management, super detailed, you know, social media focus, uh, F and B rooftops, you know, high margin activities, capital market savvy, just sort of the whole integrated approach to owning and managing. You have an institutional mindset, but you think like an owner and you're entrepreneurial. I want to talk about like how you set up the firm and the decision-making process, whether it's new investments or asset management, what what does the whole organization look like? And it feels like pretty lean. Yeah, look, and I would say I have an institutional mindset. I have an entrepreneurial mindset, but with an institutional overlay, right? Like um, we, we really try, I try to strike that balance between having and sort of personally, and then also with my team, I try to sort of constantly uh, walk the walk, but also discuss this and, and sort of inculcate my teammates with the same ethos, which is that hungry, scrappy, entrepreneurial, feisty, nimble uh, in the way we act and react and, and get after stuff, but also have a very analytical, data-driven, sort of institutionalized approach to underwriting and to and to owning and managing and and reporting. Right, so. Sophisticated institutional investors are very comfortable partnering with us because we speak a very sophisticated institutional language. But I say to my team, we never want to lose that sort of entrepreneurial fire in our belly that has allowed us to sort of start the company, grow the company, and, and navigate the various shoals and black swan events successfully. Um, so to answer your question, Oxford Capital Group is the mothership, right? That's sort of the investor developer sponsoring vehicle. And we've got a great team around me, chief operating officer, development officer, financial officers, investment team member, acquisitions, finance, accounting, treasury. And then the two primary operating divisions, Oxford Hotels and Resorts, where I have a president who's lived and breathed operations for 40 years. And then likewise in the hotel space and then Oxford Living in the senior housing space, assisted living, independent living, memory care. Uh, another guy who's been in the space for 40 plus years, living and breathing that. So I'm sort of the founder, chairman, CEO, and, and sit at the epicenter of it, but work really closely and collaboratively with my team at the investment and development company, the sponsoring sort of mothership, Oxford Capital Group, but also with the key operating divisions and the senior people in those divisions. So we're really synchronized quite closely. We have a, a pretty good overlap at the corporate office between sort of people who are sort of partly staffed at Oxford Capital Group, but sort of partly staffed at Oxford Hotels and Resorts and, uh, and Oxford Living. So we really sort of cross fertilize there and it keeps us quite integrated. Do you think of yourself as very strategy driven? Like, you know, you tell your team, all right, I want to buy a hotel in San Francisco where you're more opportunistic, where you have a theme, but you're open to, you know, various strategies around the theme. Yeah, it's a good question. Look, every year we do a deep dive strategy retreat where, where we sort of assess, you know, let's let's assess the things that we did this year. What do we like what we did? What things could we do better, do differently? And then what are we looking at? What are we seeing? What do we what do we think could be compelling uh, in the lodging space, which is, again, the biggest vertical historically is where we spend a lot of our time and most of our time, but also senior housing and apartments and so on. So we're constantly comparing notes, you know, are there, where are the opportunities within our existing verticals? Again, with lodging being the biggest one. And then also, by the way, are there other verticals that we should be exploring, right? I mean, initially it was lodging when, uh, way back when and creating the business plan. Um, and then secondarily, it was senior housing because that was an opportunity that was sort of adjacent. It was an operationally intensive real estate, some characteristics that are similar, some that are different. Apartments, multifamily, logical, doing mixed use with urban hotels and apartments, which we're doing in several markets. But, you know, hey, build a rent. I mean, I, I, I look at it as a decathlete. Like, is there a strategy that might make sense 
a new vertical that we should create. So we're always assessing whether there are new verticals that we want to focus on. But within the existing verticals, we're assessing where are the opportunities. Is it big urban boxes that we can buy deep discounts? Is it extended stay secondary markets where we can create scale in a portfolio? Is it buying you know luxury lifestyle hotels that are uh, you know that may be doing reasonably well operationally, but they're totally upside down capital structures we can buy at discounts because we believe in the urban recovery trade. So those are discussions that we have at the beginning of every year, and then as part of our weekly pipeline discussions. Um, you know, what do we think about this? What do we think about that? So I think it's a combination of secular trends that we sort of conceptually believe make sense, but then very much trolling constantly to find spot market opportunities within those trends that we think uh, represent a compelling risk adjusted opportunity. And so, you know, constantly trolling, underwriting, in, in, touring, reviewing conference calls, you know, just keeping sharp, keeping smart, getting a lot of reps, like a lot of practice reps. I use the sort of sports term, right? Where we're doing a lot of underwriting reps, a lot of bidding, a lot of touring, a lot of underwriting. And we'll say, look, you know, here's the price to where we like this asset. And they're like, well, it's not going to trade. Okay. Well, you know, here's where we are. Come back to us if you guys decide to trade. So I think it's, again, a lot of spot market opportunities that emerge by virtue of us trolling constantly across the landscape but within secular trends that we are fundamentally believers in. What have you learned most about building a real estate company? Like when you think about it over the past 20 years, what stands out as a key learning for you? You know, last 30 plus years, hard to believe. Um, look, I would say, I mean, it, you know, it sounds cliche. I would say, you know, and this is sort of the case for any company, you know, surround yourself with like-minded teammates that people have complementary skills, right? I mean, that's so cliche, but it's true. Um, you find people, encourage people to uh, debate you in a constructive way. I mean, I, you know, here's my view as what as I say at the front end, but guys, I want to hear the point and the counterpoint. So really encouraging people to sort of constructively challenge assumptions uh, has been really important uh, for us to, you know, net net have a good, uh, strong sort of investment GPA, if you will, uh, and development GPA. Um Encouraging constructive dissent and constructive dialogue around the pros and the, and the cons of a given opportunity or a given strategy. Uh, surrounding yourself with, again, people who have complementary strengths. Uh, making sure to give people, um, strike a balance between being collaborative and, and, and tuned in, but it also giving them a, a fair amount of free reign to sort of live their lives and, and, and quarterback their own situations. I try not to micromanage my team. I try to collaborate and drop in and, and help collaborate in key times uh, so that they know I'm in the trenches because I want to weigh in with a perspective or a question or a comment, but I also don't want to smother them with micromanagement. And if they earn my trust uh, and they earn my respect, I give them more and more free reign. Um, and I think the other thing is sort of transparency. I get I have everybody give themselves a self-review at the end of every year. I want you guys to give a detailed self-review. Here are all the accomplishments that you're proud of. Here are the things you worked on. Here are the things you think you've been particularly good at. And here are the things that you think you could be better at. And I ask all of them to do that for themselves. It helps them to be, I think it helps them to sort of introspectively do that. And then it helps me review it and assess it. And in most cases, you know, I agree. I, you know, these are all the things you did well. These are the things that you need to work on. And then I might add, I think you should do a little more of this and a little more of that. And if you do that, you're going to continue to grow and, and, and grow in your success generally and with our company. So a big believer in that sort of transparent, you know, civilized uh, interaction, but transparent feedback. And I also ask every one of them in all of the reviews, what can I do better? Please tell me, um, how can I be a more effective leader for you? How can I be a better leader for you? Are there things you think I should be doing more of or less of? To make me effective and us effective, I, and I and I got a good enough rapport with all of my teammates. I got a lot of longtime teammates at the investment company as well as the operational companies, and 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 I think they, you know they 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 tell me. I mean, yeah, but you know, well, there isn't much, or yeah, I think you know if you did a little more of this or a little less of that, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. I mean, I want that feedback so that I can be as effective for myself and for the team and the company and for them as I can be. So those are all things that I've learned, I think, Jake, in sort of starting and growing a company and ultimately multiple companies. Um, 
And, you know, it's deeply gratifying to, to do a standing start and to get after it and to scale. But, you know, victory is never final and defeat is never final, right? we got to continually stay at it and proactively engage and, and, and get after it and stay hungry. At the same time, as you get a little deeper into your life journey, you know, I've really uh, certainly along the way, I've worked hard, but I tried to work smart and leverage my through through a lot of good people so that I've enjoyed the journey. Right. I've done, you know, the helicopter ski with my, you know, with my you know, and family and, 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 you know, trips around the world and, you know, all sorts of great adventures and scuba diving and all sorts of things with my wife and kids all along the way. So I've worked hard, but I knock on wood, I've managed to work reasonably smart so that I've really had an enjoyable journey while we're, you know, getting after it on the business front. What would you like to be doing more of and what would you like to be doing less of? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, it's interesting. I honestly, I, I would say, look, I would say in the near term, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to there being more transaction activity. And to be honest with you, I, I don't, it's not like I'm looking for more leisure time. I, I, I work hard. I work most of the time, but I also weave in, you know, ski trips and sailing trips and other fun adventures and tennis trips and, so I weave in a, a, a robust sort of personal, social, civic life and boards and all sorts of engagement. I believe in sort of being the, you know, a more of a multidimensional decathlete. Those were always my role models. And, and so, you know, that we're sort of happy, loving family life and, and uh, active civic life and social life and athletic uh, cultural life, uh, but also a you know, robust uh, business career that they're successful in. Um, and so, for me, it's not like there are a whole bunch, oh gosh, I wish I had more time to do this or do that. I mean, I travel as much as I need to or want to. Um, and and sometimes you need a break from your breaks, right? So it's like, all right, I want to get back in the action. I would say the thing that I miss right now is doing more transactions, right? The last 18 months, you know, we were quite aggressive during COVID. And then sort of COVID too was the interest rate increase, right? It just sort of shut everything down. And so between construction costs and supply chain issues and, and, and interest rates, very tough to make uh, transactions pencil, acquisitions, developments, redevelopments. So we were executing and are executing on a lot of existing stuff that we either bought during COVID or financed during COVID that we're opening and ramping. So we've got plenty to do across lodging and senior housing and apartments. But I have missed the more dynamic velocity of you know, multiple acquisitions and you know, development financings and, you know, the sense of really offensive accomplishment, right? I've missed that. And so I wish we were doing more of that. And I hope we'll be able to do more of that over the next 12 to 36 months. Me too. John, I ask all the guests on the podcast the same closing question. And outside of your own portfolio, what is your favorite hotel? What is my favorite hotel? Wow. Um, I should have thought about this in advance. Um, wow. You know, I have to say, um, this may be a bit of an unexpected answer, um, but one of my best hotel memories was staying at the Keneal Bay, which was one of the old rock resorts down in the, in the islands. Um, you know, uh, Lawrence Rockefeller was ahead of his time creating these eco-friendly resorts, Little Dicks Bay and Keneal Bay. So it's 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 absolutely luxurious, but in a very understated way uh, and in a very sort of nature forward way. And so I really loved the product. Um, I love the vision. I love the location. And then I happen to just have a wonderful set of memories with my wife and young kids at Keneal Bay uh, when they were relatively young, which you know, may be one of my best sort of hotel memories. So let's go with Keneal Bay. I'm not even sure if it still exists with hurricanes and all the rest. Well, it's an interesting story. So maybe you and I will JV and we could buy it, but it's owned by, I think, the Government Services Administration right now and is basically abandoned. And I think if you Google it, you can see like a picture of a, you know, a chain link fence with a government sign and it's probably one of those things that some bureaucrat is just sitting on and doesn't realize what he has and someone could buy it for a pretty nice price. Amen. I think, well, I, I sort of had vaguely recalled that maybe it was, it gotten hammered in a hurricane. So it's a good prompt. We'll have to brainstorm and potentially look at that. But, you know, anything for me, 
you know, the memories, again, the, the experience, the memories, you know, I spent a lot of time with my wife and kids, uh, really tried to sort of have them be on the journey with me all along. And so a lot of great memories. Um, and those are the memories that I cherish the most. Thanks for coming on the podcast. This is fun. Jake, great to see you. Well done for creating this uh, really insightful, articulate questions. You're a sharp young guy getting after it, which I respect, fellow YPO or so. Um, look forward to comparing notes on this and hopefully we'll get a good edit and we'll hopefully at least a couple people will care about it. A lot of people will care about it. I appreciate you. Take care. Hey everyone, it's Jake here. Thanks again for joining me on this conversation. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Lastly, don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Jay Warzak. I'll see you in the next episode. Jake Warzak is the founder and CEO of Dove Hill Capital Management. All opinions expressed by Jake and his guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Dove Hill Capital Management. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not reflect or represent real estate, financial, or investment advice.